Hey, aloha, and welcome back to this very special edition of Out and About. This is a show where we explore people, events, and organizations that are doing good in our community and finding out more about them. So today we are especially delighted to have back as a guest uh, in a different role, uh, Dave Watase. And Dave is running for council seat number five on the Honolulu City Council. Uh, so welcome back to the show, Dave. Thanks, Winston. Um, glad to be here. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the viewers uh, on, think, on your Think Tech program. Um, again, my name is Dave Watase. I'm running for City Council District 5. Um, I decided to run uh, because I'm concerned about the direction that our city is going. Uh, recently, through my activism and going to seven neighborhood boards, I I kind of realized that you know our city is kind of like going and taking the wild and crazy route, and um, it bothered me to a point where I felt I needed to get involved, and I felt that the community and the residents uh, needed a voice uh, because there seems to be a lack of accountability and transparency in our government today. I also feel that the city council is a very important mechanism to keep our leadership in check. And, uh, you know, especially now with the COVID, you know, I think there's gonna be very, some very serious uh, economic uh, ramifications uh, and that no, you mean we have to make. Uh, so you're not a politician. You haven't run for political office before, right? I'm a civil engineer. Um, I went to Kansas State University and I worked for a family business which specialized in building affordable housing, uh, you know, for, for usually for the first time uh, homeowners. Um, and you're, lo you're a local boy? Yeah, um, I basically, uh, I'm living in the home I grew up in. Uh, up on St. Louis Heights. I went to Hokalani Elementary School, our Redeemer Lutheran, and then St. Louis High School. Played uh, Little League Baseball at Connie White Park and uh, used to play in, in Manoa Street, you know, on the and this, when Okay, so you're looking to represent the very area that you grew up in uh, and with school in and all of that. So uh, up at the top of St. Louis Heights, you mentioned the seven neighborhood boards. Is that basically the area that would be uh, uh, council? number five district? Yeah, it includes uh, Palolo, uh, Kaima, Lower Kaimaki, um, you know, Diamond Head, well, not Diamond Head, but Kapahulu, um, you know, all everything Malco of the Alawai Canal, and it goes down to Ward Avenue, and Makiki, Manoa, St. Louis Heights, Makali, and Mu'ilili. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's pretty central, right? Uh, just smoke of, of Waikiki, I guess, more or less, as opposed to some other districts, which are quite spread out. So that makes uh, campaigning maybe a little bit easier, but um, I don't know, you got, it's, it's a lot of people that you'd be representing, probably what, about 200,000 or something? Oh no, not that many, maybe 100,000? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I was told, you know, there's maybe about 80,000 registered voters. About 80,000. Um, and 35,000 plus uh, households. So it's a difficult area to canvas. Like I said, I've never done this before, uh, just having to deal with uh, the camp campaign spending and all the requirements, uh, you know, was a monumental uh, task for me. Now, well, you got started in this as a, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt and cut you off sometimes with the Zoom, it's a little bit hard to know when to jump in, but you got started in, um, I would say that um, in a community activist role and I had, termed you the accidental activist because you were just sort of thrust into it and you found out some things along the way. What got you involved in community activities? And since that time, what have you learned? What have you, what have, um, what are the groups have you encountered and what are, what's the message that you're hearing um, from those groups? Well, originally I got involved because the Alwa Canal Flood Mitigation Project by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they basically wanted to do eminent domain on property I own in Palolo Valley that I had purchased really to be my legacy for my children so that they could afford 
someday to build a home uh, on that property uh, so that they could, you know, live in, in Honolulu. And um, I decided that I didn't want to let it happen. Uh, I felt, and I went through, uh, you know, their draft EIS, and they gave me basically two to six weeks to respond to it. There was two weeks before the final public meeting, and then I could turn in comments of they extended it for 30 days. But, you know, I always thought the government was there to protect me and my rights. And, you know, I found out differently that, you know, uh, they basically had projects in the makings that had very little community engagement. And uh, I decided to take, take it to task. And I ran around the seven neighborhood boards. Uh, I got resolutions. I, I went house to house to hundreds of households and uh, talk to the people. You know, I think I did more engagement than the Army Corps did in 20 years uh, on this project. And I did it on my own dime, on my own time, and it wasn't that hard to do. And I, I don't understand why the government uh, seems to be rushed about everything. And they, they do things with a lack, again, of transparency. And sometimes they just go out and bulldoze things. And you, you know, once you do it, you can't replace it. So it, it really bothered me what's going on right now. And as you're reaching out, it seems like you've connected with other groups during that time uh, with, in connection with the Alawai project. What are some other ones that you've touched upon? And are those the same themes that you're hearing again and again, transparency, accountability? Yeah, so you know, uh, people started taking notice of what I was doing. And even from, you know, good almost two years ago, people were concerned that, you know, Ann Kobayashi, who's a champion for the underdog and the little guy, uh, was going to be terminal out or retiring. And, you know, just out of the blue, guys would come out to me and say, Dave, you know, uh, you should consider running for city council. And, you know, I just kind of laughed it off and like, you know, that's the last thing on my mind. But I, I too was personally concerned that, you know, Ann Kobayashi was going to retire because you know what, you, you can't, Ann, you got to stay there. We need you. Yes. <laughs> and, and um, you know, again, over the past two years, a lot of people, uh, neighborhood board members, uh, people, leaders of various uh, groups would ask me. And uh, they saw what I was doing with the Alawai Canal project. And, you know, they offered help. And I offered to help them. I said, hey, you know, we can work together. We will be stronger. So we teamed up together, uh, groups like uh, Malama Moana, uh, Save Al Moana Beach Park Hui. Um, I, I began working with them and we actually succeeded in getting the mayor to change his mind about building a world-class playground, you know, on Al Moana Beach Park. Uh, we got him to design, you know, downsize some of his, his initial improvements or elements of his project. But even though we still have problems with, with transparency and, and how they do their construction, you know, um, so it's a continued effort. I've, I've also uh, sympathized with Save Our Sherwoods. You know, when I grew, when I was little in high school, uh, you know, we used to go to Sandy's Makapu, Bellows and Sherwoods, you know, and it was uh, during the summer, uh, beach day all the time and during the weekends. So I sympathized with what was going on there. And when I saw the destruction that the bulldozers did, you know, you really can't go back and replant the area and put it back to the way it was once it's done. And I, I think, you know, it's better to be on the safe side you know, and it wouldn't have been too difficult to halt the project or postpone it, you know, to meet and hear out what the concerns of the communities were, you know, and try to address it, you know, and when you look at what happened, it was done all wrong. And it seems to be a recurring uh, thing, you know, with our current administration, that there's too many projects to me in my mind that are done all wrong in the wrong way, with a severe lack of community engagement. You know, it, 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 it's not going to hurt us if we spend a little bit more time, you know, uh, engaging with the community. And, and I think that's so, so important. In fact, you know, I told the Army Corps that that's their job. You know, that's the most important aspect of their job. 
And anybody can go award a contract, you know, design a plan. I say, but the most important thing that they failed to do was to engage the community and the residents who are the stakeholders and who will be impacted. And, you know, that's, that's what I thought the EIS was all about, you know, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I was wrong. Well, you've learned, you've learned a lot. And, and like you said, there's no shame in, in taking time to make considered, measured, good decisions with public input. And I think that people are feeling that lack of transparency and accountability, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, around the island. And you can just sort of do a mental circle around the island. And I think you're, um, and even the, the state, but since you're not running for the state office yet, um, the uh, you can see that there's just issue after issue going clockwise or counterclockwise where people are feeling unheard or ignored or sidelined or whatever it is uh, where people are standing up and willing to get arrested or um, uh, you know hopefully everything is, is peaceful but and you don't want it to get to that point you don't want people getting arrested you want community engagement beforehand to to uh, to, uh, to listen respectfully two members so that we can do that. And that's, that's uh, now you're stepping up in that role to be part of the solution um, on a broader scale. So I applaud you for running. And uh, it's, it's no small task as you've been finding out, there's a ton of issues that everybody expects you to be up to speed on and have a position on and, and all of that. Do you have positions on everything? Do you, or how are you gonna tackle everything? What's your philosophy? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know all the issues. Uh, but I'm willing to take them on. I'm willing to study them, uh, you know, research it, and go out and engage the community on things that I think would, you know, that would concern them. I think you need somebody who who can flag the the inconsistencies in these projects because that's not being done right now. And if you look around at all the projects, it it's not logical. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You know, I, I, I think there's a, uh, definitely a need for improvement. Uh, I wanna be the voice of the community. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'm, I'm really all good. Uh, I really don't have to run for office. Um, you know, my kids are pretty much old and, and, and get, you know, but, but it's, I really thought that we need help preparing the island for the future of the next generation. What's next? And, and you're t and and like you said, Anne has been a champion for the community and this and this area, a voice of reason, a voice of sanity, um, maturity, um, common sense, uh, and, and listens to people and, and has been very responsive to concerns. So you know, it'd be big shoes to fill, but I, I think that it's really impressive and telling that Anne has endorsed you uh, for. Um, her seat that she's currently occupying. Yeah, it, I mean, actually what happened, the way it happened was um, almost a year ago, she approached me and she asked me if I'd consider running for a seat. And again, uh, like, you know, a lot of other people have asked me, I kind of brushed it off and laughed it off and thought that would be the last thing that I'd consider doing. Um, you know, but as I got more involved in activism, as I got to learn more about what was going on at the neighborhood boards and the concerns of the community, whether it be homelessness or crime, uh, you know, even COVID hitting uh, our economy and, and our tourist industry and, and exposing the vulnerabilities of us not being diversified enough. Um, I, I see the need for uh, good leadership. Uh, and I think I can, you know, be that on the city council. You know, um, you know I'm, I'm 61 years old. Uh, you know, I started off as a little kid over here, uh, you know, as a child, uh, you know, then I got married. So I've been a good husband uh, and then I'm a good father and my kids are all through college right now and they're pretty much going to the next, next step. And, and you're a good community member because you've been active and engaged in something that's that's meaningful for you and a lot of other people um, exactly. that you've been able to give voice to. And I, I, you know, it's, I think in our society, people want others to step up and to do something. Why don't they? Why don't they? They should, right? And 
whoever they, the mythical they is, but we are the mythical they. We are the ones that need to step up. We're the ones that need to report, that need to show up, that need to testify, that need to run for office. And uh, I think, you know, something interesting is you are a, a you're a wrestling coach. That is uh, something that you got in your background. So you have to know some strategy and you're an engineer. So you got to have, you want to engineering, engineers should come up with logical, um, sustainable, um, doable solutions that are, that are, uh, that are coherent. And so I, I know you would bring that as well. Um, are you a PE just by out of curiosity? Uh, no. No, okay. Not. Yeah. But the civil engineers, you're, you're by civil engineers, you're training. Okay. Uh, I got, I got a couple of issues. I was wondering if you'd, you'd tell me about, um, what do you think about, and you may not have an answer, like you said, and I, I really appreciate that thought that when issues come before you and you don't know what they will be, you, you, no one could have predicted COVID, but how is the city going to respond to that? All the things that come up, you're going to have those coming up too. And so having a measured response and saying, I'm just going to do my best, it seems like a you know, really wise uh, way to go about it um, from my perspective, at least. Um, there's some things that, that are on people's minds. You may have some position. How about the train? Should it stop at Middle Street? Should it be rerouted up to King or Baratania? Should it stay in the floodplain? Should it go to Ala Moana? Should we uh, just kind of put it on pause for a little bit once it hits middle and see where we're at financially? Or what are you thinking? Well, I'm, I, I think we need to get more information about the project, whether or not it can be finished on time and on budget. Uh, given COVID, uh, you know, the heart is depending upon the half percent GT and TAT uh, to fund the, the, the rail and the increases to nine to $10 billion. Um, you know, I think every day something changes, the price goes up and it gets pushed down further down the road. Uh, it's a moving target. Um, you know, I, I just, no other project I think it has ever been done this way. Uh, most projects, when you think about it, uh, you have a set of plans, uh, you have specifications, uh, they're detailed, uh, you, you know what the scope of the work is, you put it out for bid and you, bid, you build it. You know, in this case, uh, they don't know what the project's really going to look like. They don't really know how they're going to finance it. And, and it seems as though it just keeps on increasing and keeps on being pushed down the road. So I think a forensic audit uh, is necessary. I think it would expose the problems that we have. You know, there's several hundred million dollars that they don't know what happened to. Uh, and we need to lock down the price. Uh, and, it, and I think if, if, if the revenue is not there to pay for it, how are we gonna do it? You know, does that mean we can float bonds for this thing? Uh, is, Someone's got to pay for it somehow. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. It, it might be that the experts determine that, you know what, right now the revenue is not there, we cannot afford it. Uh, if, if that's the case, then we're going to have to look at uh, maybe putting it on pause, maybe really getting the plans and specifications down to a T, knowing what we're building, where we're building it, and how we're going to do it, okay, because we've done a lot of development with the TOD plan. You know, Alamoana Kaka'ako is all building out right now with the anticipation that this rail will come through. At the same time, we might not be able to afford it. You know, and, and if you're gonna burden the taxpayers and the residents, many of which the rail doesn't even service them, uh, I, I think that's unfair too. So I think, you know, we really have to look at it, you know, from a standpoint of can we afford it? Uh, you also have the situation of maybe, you know, if, if we don't complete it for the full length, um, you know, we may have to forfeit the federal money. But, you know, Hart is working on a public-private partnership agreement that supposedly is going to be the answer to all. So we have to see where that, what that entails. You know, again, oh, a matter so of transparency and accountability. Okay, and, uh, and take an open mind and looking at it and maybe... You, a lot of different options are uh, open for you, depending on, uh, like you just said. How about this, uh, the idea of redoing Blaisdell or Aloha Stadium? Any thoughts on those? Well, I, 
I mean, I, I think again, even the Aloha Stadium, when you look at some of those plans, you know, it, it again, in, it's working around the TOD, you know, which is increasing the density and whether it be housing or condominiums, um, you know, around the, tri uh, the rail stations. You know, um, yeah, our Aloha Stadiums is kind of old and falling apart, it's still usable. Um, but again, if it, I think it all comes down to the budget and that's a state thing uh, more than anything else. And the state is gonna be hit really hard because their revenue is all based on, uh, you know, income taxes. And uh, versus the city, I think they're projecting $130 million shortfall this coming year. But it's, it's gonna get worse because there's gonna be that domino effect that, you know, property values, I think, are going to fall, you know, as, you know, if people, if the hotel industry doesn't recover fast enough, uh, which I think is, is going to take many years before we get back, you know, to even anything close to it, um, you know, without this, the higher room occupancy rates, uh, without the higher room rates, it's going to be hard for hotels to sustain the wage rates and the benefits that you know we currently have. You know, the business model is going to change for all the hotels, yeah. all the retailers, and and even the cost of housing and the demand could definitely take a downturn. So we have to see what's going to happen on the property tax revenue side. And then again, um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of hurt, you know, down the road. You know, a lot and, of hurt and, down the road. Um, some hard choices that are going to have to be made. Do you balance your checkbook to the penny every month? Uh, no, my wife does that. Okay, <laughs> so you will rely on 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 expert advisors for a lot of different things, which is good to hear. Um, what do you think are the main problems facing our city in and our island and keeping it livable and sustainable? Well, I think the most important issue is. Um, you know, cost of living. And most of that has to do with affordable housing. Uh, my concern is, you know, all the residents over here uh, conserve. You know, we use less water. Uh, we, we've gone solar. Uh, we've got LED light bulbs all over the place. Uh, we've got energy efficient refrigerators and washers. And as we, we're, we're moving in that direction, you know, there's incentives being given uh, you know, to do these things. But the problem I see is whenever we save on our natural resources, and I might think, gee, by using less water and protecting our aquifer for the future generations, when in reality, water water supply just turns around and sells it to uh, the builders of these luxury condominiums. My concern is I can only conserve so much. I can only cut down my electricity uses so much. Uh, you know, we have problems regarding sewer capacity, our infrastructure is falling apart. And when it comes time that maybe we decide to actually build more affordable units, truly affordable units, um, my concern is they're going to go like, you know what, uh, we actually don't have enough power. We don't have enough uh, sewer capacity. We don't have enough uh, water. We need to put in another pump station. We need to build another power plant. And and you need to pay for it, then our affordable housing is not going to be affordable anymore because rather than save it and conserve it for our children, we actually sold it to the highest bidder, the foreign investor, uh, you know, coming in, uh, buying some luxury condominiums. And I also have a problem with, uh, you know, the TOD, they going up to 400 feet in exchange for uh, providing some affordable housing. I, I really don't think it's working well. The affordable units that I've seen being presented at the neighborhood boards are 120% of the median income, and you really have to be rich to buy one of those. I, yeah. I, I think we'd be better off, you know, letting them build those things, but making them pay, you know, uh, heavily for the resources that they use. And in exchange, we maybe go further away from the prime real estate the prime ocean views, and we go maybe down to Makali and Mo'ili'ili, uh, closer toward King and Baratania, 
you know, most of those homes and apartments there are old, uh, dilapidated, and, you know, falling apart. And uh, build affordable housing in those areas because, um, you know, the land values are, are less. And we can build bigger, um, built, you know, condominiums uh, or apartments, you know, that are affordable, truly affordable for our children and our kapuna. You know, I think we can do a lot of, um, uh, you know, senior uh, living homes. Uh, in fact, I was at a neighborhood board in uh, Makali Mo'ilili uh, and uh, they have a project called Hale Makana O Mo'ilili. It's a 105 unit, uh, you know, project for 55 and older is targeting 30, 50 and 60% AMI. Um, it's right behind the Mo'ili library. Seems like we're gonna need a lot more of that stuff. Yeah, and, and we're gonna need- 100 seven, times fold, yeah. 100 times fold and a lot of sane uh, leaders in making these decisions as we're looking at infrastructure and carrying capacity and what's just sane and right to do for our island. Um, you know, I, I, I'm grateful that, that you're running, that your opponents are running as well doing your part to uphold uh, our, our great system that we have uh, in this country and in this state. I applaud you for, for running, Dave, and uh, respect your community activism until now. Unfortunately, we are out of time. It always goes by so fast. For people to get more information on your website, they can go, I can see right behind your head, DaveWatase.com. Uh, so please uh, check out Dave's web website, see if you got some questions, you can ask them right there. And, um, you know, thank you for being on the show, Dave. And I wish you all the best in this uh, election and then whatever comes next. Okay, mahalo, Milo. Okay, <laughs> aloha.